This video looks at episodes 18 to 23 of season 1 of Star Trek, the original series or generation, to identify historical references which can be used to determine the original history of the Star Trek universe. Special thanks to the transcripts which can, which can be found on the Shakote site. The episode order is the production order. In order to understand the development of the history or vision, we need to study the episodes in the order they were written, not transmitted. While I'm uncertain of the exact writing order, the production order is about as close as I can get, and that's what's shown here. When Gene Roddenberry created Star Trek back in 1966, he had a vision, which actually remained reasonably consistent over the following three years and three seasons. The animated series and even early movies retained this consistency. When The Next Generation was released in 1987, Gene's vision had changed and the past needed to change in order to be consistent with this new vision. This video series will look at the original vision of Star Trek, starting with the earliest source material. Any historical facts from later sources which contradict the early references must be assumed to be in error. Minor changes in nomenclature can be excused. The Squire of Gothos is the 17th episode of the first season. It was the 18th episode produced. There is no mention of the Earth Federation or photon torpedoes in this episode. The Enterprise is called USS Enterprise. Another colony a planet is mentioned in this episode called uh, Colony Beta 6. No details are provided about the colony planet apart from the fact it needs supplies and it's on the other side of some kind of void. Kirk states, Ahead warp factor 3, Mr. Sulu. Colony Beta 6 wants their supplies. Let's get across this void in a hurry. Spock replies, Thank you, Dr. McCoy. Moving on schedule into quadrant 904. Beta 6 is 8 days distant. According to this episode, the Earth is 900 light years away, which is confirmed later. Because Spock is surprised the planet was not identified earlier, there must be some traffic in this part of space. The conclusion is that colony Beta 6 is further away from Earth and a space void needs to be crossed in order to reach it. This means the Federation could be a sphere 900 light years or more in size. This makes the Federation a lot larger than previously estimated. McCoy states, Void, Star Desert. The world conjures up pictures of dunes, oases and mirages. Kirk replies, Sunlight, palm trees. We're 900 light years from that kind of desert, Bones. The Enterprise finds an uncharted planet in the middle of the void, which is called Agothos. It's an artificial planet created by some type of superior energy being called Trelane. Ship's log 2124.5. First Officer Spock reporting for Captain James Kirk. We are orbiting the lone unrecorded planet in the Star Desert. For four hours we have made every possible instrument sweep, but Captain Kirk and Helmsman Sulu remain unaccounted for. I have placed the ship on red alert. Trelane states, Welcome to an island of peace on my stormy little planet of Gothos. Trelane views Earth from 900 light years away, thus sees Earth 900 years ago. He mentions Napoleon, who was at his peak about 1805. This makes it 2805, which cannot be the case. If this is 2264, then Trelane is viewing Earth during the year 1364, which is in the Middle Ages, and he should not be able to see Napoleon. I suspect an error has been made, and the distance is actually 460 light years away, which will allow Napoleon to be mentioned. If this is correct, the size of the Federation is about the size I earlier estimated, which is 300 to 400 light year radius with Earth in the centre. Yaga states, Notice the period, Captain, 900 light years from Earth. It's what might be seen through a viewing scope if it was powerful enough. Trelane replies, Ah, yes, I've been looking in on the doings of your lively little Earth. Kirk adds, Then you've been looking in on the doings, doings 900 years past. Trelane calls humans a predestal species which preys on itself. This is apparently rare. Thinking about it, there are few examples of non-human races fighting themselves in the original series, or at least up until this point. If this is correct, it makes humans a rather vicious race. Trelane states, I wouldn't hear of it. You shall join me in a repast. I want to learn all about your feelings on war and killing and conquest, that sort of thing. 
Do you know that you're one of the few predator species that preys even on itself? The crew of the Enterprise is 400, less the crew on the planet. In shore leave it was 430 or 431, or you could even assume 436, depending on the, the way the sentence was constructed. Kirk states, there are 400 men and women aboard that ship. Let's assume that uh, Kirk was just rounding. There is a, a Space Fleet Command. This may have been an early version of Starfleet. This is the second mention of a military command organisation. Uhuru states, Shall I make a full report to Space Fleet Command, sir? Trelane and his parents represent some type of pure mentality. Perhaps they are the Q. Spock states, For the record, how do we describe him? Pure mentality, force of intellect, embodied energy, super being. He must be classified, sir. The Federation may be a sphere 900 light years or more in all directions from Earth. This makes it larger than I earlier estimated. It could be, thus, over 3.2 billion square light years in size. Memory Alpha states there are 700 colony planets in the Federation. So far, every colony planet is inhabited by humans. We know there are a large number of non-colonies. For example, Mars is a non-colony, which has, in turn, colonies of its own. Most of these planets are also human inhabited. If we look at the next generation, there is a statement that there were 150 planets in the Federation in 2063, as this was supposed to be two years after the Federation was founded and Earth managed to fight the Romulans to a standstill uh, before this date. The bulk of these planets were probably human planets. If this was not the case, then the Federation would be a superpower that could easily defeat the Romulans or Klingons, and the Federation would not be as cautious about the neutral zone. This is because if the Earth-inhabited planets were strong enough to fight the Romulans to stand hill, just imagine what would occur if you add all these other allied planets. It would be a superpower. On the other hand, I suspect the next generation represents an alternate timeline, and we shouldn't really look to it very much in, t in terms of trying to understand the original generation or the original series. If we go back to our 900 light year radius, if this is correct, the density of inhabited planets is very low, with the planets being separated by an average of 150 light years. There is a high probability that Alpha Centauri consists of five colony planets, so the value of 700 colony planets may mean colony systems Otherwise, the density would even be lower and the distances between inhabited planets even greater. At 400 times light speed, it would take four to five months to travel between planets with this level of density. If we assume that 900 light years to beta 6 is the furthest point of the Federation, which could be the case considering a starship is being used to provide supplies, the actual Federation is a lot smaller and the distances between planets are more reasonable distance. So this is one mechanism to reconcile it. However, the big problem we have is that if Trelane looks back 900 years, he's looking at a different Earth. He's almost certainly looking back a distance which is closer to about 460 light years, not 900. If we go back to the next generation, there is a statement there that says the Federation spans 8,000 8, light years, which seems far too large. The galaxy's only... 1,000 light years deep, so assuming this means 8,000 by 8,000 by 1,000, we end up with an area of 640 billion light years, with distances between systems being 400 light years on average, which is one year at warp factor one. I think the latter reference is simply wrong, and using the next generation to try and understand Star Trek, particularly at this point, may not be a very wise thing to do. On the other side of the, or, or in, you know, in defense of next generation, I actually think the density of um, inhabited planets is far too high in Star Trek, even in next generation. So, you know, the Federation probably is or should be this large. But if we're going to have that kind of scenario, then our warp drive has to be significantly faster than it is in any of the series. So, you know, it's a bit of a conundrum here. So in conclusion, I personally feel the actual size of the Federation is about 450 light years in all directions from Earth. Colony Beta 6 could be, the, could be some far-flung outpost beyond a void which requires the starship to provide it with supplies. Thus, this planet represents some form of unusual outpost. 
If this is correct, the distance between inhabited planets seem more reasonable, considering the speed of warp. The other possible theory is the 900 light year distance from Earth is probably half that in order for Trelane to be viewing an Earth with Napoleon in it. The final point is Trelane looks, looks like he comes from the Q, and it's an interesting theory. Arena is the 18th episode of the first season. It was the 19th episode produced. By this episode, all the basic terms used in Star Trek have been mentioned, such as phases, deflectors, federation, photon, torpedo, shuttles, diluthium, USS Enterprise, and starship. Cestus III is a small colony or outpost on the edge of Federation space. It apparently is within the territory of another race, the Gorn. McCoy states, I wonder if he brought his personal chef along with him to Cestus III. Kirk replies, This colony is isolated, exposed, out on the edge of nowhere. He probably wants additional advice. Later, Kirk states, Cestus III has been destroyed. Captain's log, stardate. 30, 45.6. The Enterprise has responded to a call from Earth Observation Outpost on Cestus 3. On landing, we have discovered that the outpost has been destroyed. In this episode, we discovered that disruptors are far more powerful than hand phases. We've heard of disruptors previously, but um, the fact that they're more powerful than hand, hand phases has not been disclosed. Spock states, We're hopelessly outnumbered here, Captain. It's those disruptors versus our hand phases. This episode has the first mention and use of photon torpedoes, although we never see them. The torpedoes need to be armed and can be fired by banks. Just a quick note, in an earlier episode, there is a something that looks very similar to a photon torpedo, although it's not called such. Kurt states, arm your fo photon torpedoes. Sulu replies, aye aye sir, arm photon torpedoes, stand by. DePaul confirms, Mr. Sulu, phot photon torpedoes locked on. Sulu speaks back to Kirk, photon torpedoes locked on, Captain. Kirk orders, fire all banks. Sulu states, all banks fired, sir. It seems the colony of Cestus III was well armed. It had an arsenal, which has a grenade launcher, which appears to fire nuclear warheads and phaser batteries. Kirk states, can you remember the layout of this place, the arsenal? In the arsenal, Kirk states, we'll see how ingenious they are. Here, give me a, a hand with this grenade launcher, Lang. Kowalski replies, if I was them, I'd go to the high ground on the right. I make it 1200 yards, azimuth 87. It's pretty close for one of these little jewels, Captain. Kirk states back, it'll be a lot closer to them, stand clear. Later, a survivor states, they came in space normal speed, using our regular approach routes, but they knocked out our phaser batteries with their first salvo. From then on, we were helpless. We weren't expecting anything. Why should we? We didn't have anything anyone would want. The alien ship, which we later learn is a Gorn ship, can travel up to warp 7. The Enterprise can, for short distances, travel at warp 8, although this is dangerous. This is the only view of a Gorn ship we get in this episode. On the right is an estimate of what they would look like in more detail. Sulu states, They must be aware we're after them, sir. They've gone to warp 6 also. The Enterprise and Gorn ship, just before they are stopped, are beyond the Federation charts. In this case, 22.3 parsecs, which is 72 light years. As the Enterprise can probably cover this distance in about 26 days, I have to assume the colony world must be well beyond known space. DePaul states, 22.3 parsecs beyond latest chart limits, sir. We learn in this episode that a sustained warp 7 is dangerous and can cause the engines or ship to blow up. The Enterprise goes to warp 8, which I assume is even more dangerous. Spock, sust Spock states, a sustained warp 7 speed will be dangerous, Captain. Kirk replies, warp factor 8. We learn about some type of positioning system. I have no idea what it means, but it must provide a three-dimensional coordinate using some common references point. Perhaps the Earth. Kirk states, our position. DePaul states, 2279 pi, sir. Uncharted solar system at 42466 p.m. In this episode, we are introduced to a second alien race, in this case a very advanced race, which occupies a single planet called 
and are called the Metrons. The Gorn probably moved in a direction away from their home base to ensure the Federation would not find their home planet. So this may be in generally unknown space. The Metrons live for at least 1500 Earth years and probably only occupy one planet. Metron states, we are the Metrons. You are one of two crafts which have come into our space on a mission of violence. This is not permissible. Yet we have analysed you and have learnt that your violence tendency are inherent. So be it. We will control them. We will resolve your conflict in a way most suited to your limited mentalities, Captain James Kirk. Later, the Metron states, I'm approximately 1500 of your Earth years old. You surprise me, Captain. The Metrons prepare a planet with a suitable atmosphere. However, we have no idea where this is. Kirk calls this planet an asteroid. Metron states, We have prepared a planet with suitable atmosphere. You will be taken there, as will the captain of the Gorn ship, which you have been pursuing. There you will settle your dispute. Kirk states, The Enterprise is dead in space, stopped cold during the pursuit of an alien radio, radar by mysterious forces, and I have been somewhat whisked off the bridge and placed on the surface of an asteroid, facing the captain of the alien ship. Weaponless, I face a creature the Metrons call the Gorn, large, reptilian, like most humans, I seem to have an instinctive revulsion to reptiles. I must fight to remember this is an intelligence, highly advanced individual, the captain of a starship like myself, undoubtedly a dangerous, clever opponent. We get some additional information about this new alien race, the Gorn. They are reptilian and have technology equivalent to that of the Federation. Physically strong, they are slow. Very little additional information is provided apart from the Gorn being in an area space which is unexplored and uncharted by the Federation. Kirk states, this is Captain James Kirk of the Starship Enterprise. Whoever finds this, please get it to Starfleet Command. I'm engaged in personal contact combat with a creature apparently called a Gorn. Gorn replies, you were intruding, you established an outpost in our space. In conclusion... The Federation and Photon Torpedoes are mentioned for the first time. All common terms have been mentioned at this point. We are introduced to two new alien races, the Gorn, who are at a similar technological level to the Federation, and the Metrons, who are at least 1,000 years more advanced. Gorn te territory is beyond the edge of Federation space, so must be well away from the Klingons and Romulans, perhaps at a 90-degree angle to the, uh, on the other side of Federation space, but certainly not on the other side of Federation space, but certainly away from Klingons and Romulans, otherwise there would have been some record of their conflict with those two races. We get more detail about a Federation colony, which consists of women and children, but which was also well-armed. Obviously the Federation must contend with some alien or illegal violence. As this is based on a Western, this probably represents some type of frontier town, with the Gorn possibly representing natives. The final interesting piece of information is Warp 7 cannot be maintained for any period of time, and Warp 8 is very dangerous. Prior to this, the fastest speed mentioned is Warp Factor 7, so Warp 8 may represent 1,100 times the speed of light, or even more, if my Warp Factor guesses are correct. The alternative factor is the 27th episode of the first season. It was the 20th episode produced. The Enterprise surveys an unnamed planet, which in an ultimate universe houses a civilization, perhaps. Spock states, very typical, Captain, iron silicon base, oxygen hydrogen atmosphere, largely arid, no discernible life, no surprises. We hear of a Starbase 200. This could imply there are at least 200 Starbases, which seems like a very high number. Kirk states, a photographic section, begin scanning. Tie into visual section 988TG, computer bank 22, Kirk out. About four more orbits or to do it, Mr. Leslie. That'll wrap it up, lay in a course for Starbase 200. There must be faster than light communication, as the general alert from Starbase came in immediately after the disturbance occurred. Uhuru states, Standard general alert signal from Starfleet Command, Captain. Kirk replies, Lieutenant Uhuru, notify security to have an armed detachment of men ready to beam down with us. Let's go. Any word comes through from Starfleet Command, pipe it down immediately. Communication, priority one. After the disturbance occurs, Starfleet assumes this is a, a prelude to invasion. Clearly the universe of Star Trek, at least in this period, is not a nice, peaceful universe. 
Barslow explains, you may not be aware of its scope. It occurred in every quadrant of the galaxy and far beyond. Complete disruption of normal magnetic and gravimetric fields, time warp distortions, possible radiation variations, and in all of them centering on the general area which you are now patrolling. The question is, are these natural phenomena or are they mechanically created? And if they are, by whom? For what purpose? Your guess, Captain. Kirk replies, thank you, sir. I've considered all the alternatives. My best guess is it could be a prelude to invasion. The Federation clears 100 parsecs, or 326 light years, around the Enterprise. This probably implies the Enterprise must be 300 light years beyond the closest Federation planet. This is a significant distance and implies the Enterprise is roaming well beyond Federation space, or at least populated Federation space. Barslow states, negative, I'm evacuating all Starfleet units and personnel within a hundred parsec of your position. It's going to be tough on you and the Enterprise, but that's, your, that's the job you've drawn. You're on your own. This episode postulates an alternative universe, which in this case is made up of antimatter. It should be noted that we've had at least one other alternate universe episode in the past, so it seems to be a common theme in Star Trek. Time travel is also a factor in this episode. This makes for an interesting episode, but is not significant in terms of the history of the Star Trek universe. The only significant point is the time travels are travelling from the distant past, so represent a civilization which, which existed well before civilization ever occurred on Earth. Captain's Log, Stardate 3087.6. While investigating an uncharted planet, the Enterprise, and at least this entire quadrant of space, has been subject to violent, unexplained stress and force. Sensors have reported the presence of a human being on the planet below who may be connected with this phenomenon. With my first officer and a security team, I have set out in search of him. Later, Captain states, Outside, yes, that would explain a lot. Another universe, perhaps in another dimension, occupying the same spaces at the same time. Spock replies, The possible existence of a parallel universe has been scientifically conceded, Captain. Two parallel universes project this. One positive, the other negative, or more specifically, one matter and the other antimatter. We are made aware of a civilization which existed on this uninhabited planet long ago, which destroyed itself. There appears to be no physical evidence of its existence at all. Starfleet can communicate with its far-flung starships using faster-than-light communication, possibly even instantaneous communication. This is possible if we use quantum mechanics, where atoms are locked together. If this was the case, the Enterprise could always communicate with Starfleet in all cases, which is not the case in many episodes. Thus, the technology is really unknown. There is a Starbase 200, which may employ a t- imply a total of 200 Starbases, as the number of planets could not exceed 1,000. This seems excessive. Perhaps this should actually be Starbase 20, or even Starbase 2. Tomorrow is Yesterday is the 19th episode of the first season. It was the 21st episode produced. There is a Starbase 9. This is the third Starbase we've identified and kind of proves or strongly implies there are Starbases which range from at least 1 to 12. Star- Captain's Log, Stardate 3113.2. We are en route to Starbase 9 for resupply when a black star of high gravitational attraction began to drag us towards it. It required all warp power to reverse, in reverse to pull away from the star. But, like snapping a rubber band, the break away sent us plunging through space out of control to stop here, wherever we are. The Enterprise is affected by a black sun. This is obviously a black hole. Remember, this series was created back in the uh, mid-60s, and the term black hole may not have existed then. Kirk states, this is the captain. Damage control parties on all decks. Check in. All departments tie in with a record computer. Report casualties and operational readiness to the first officer. Kirk out. Lieutenant Uhuru, contact Starfleet Control. I want them alerted to the position of that black star that's in the area of Starbase 9. To the best of my knowledge, this is the first use of a tractor beam by the Enterprise, although the Enterprise has been affected by tractor beams in previous episodes. Kirk orders, Scotty, activate tractor beam, lock onto that aircraft and hold it there. Spock replies, Captain, 
This type of aircraft might be too fragile to take our tractor beam. Tractor beam on, sir. We have the target. We get a second confirmation that Kirk's full name is James T. Kirk. Kirk states, relax, Captain. You're among friends. I am Captain James T. Kirk. We discover in this episode there are 12 Enterprises in the, the fleet. While not definitive, this does seem to indicate the Enterprise is a capital ship. The Enterprise is part of a combined military organisation called United Earth Space Probe Agency. While the Federation has been mentioned as well as Starfleet, perhaps each member has its own fleet. Thus, the Earth, probably the major member of the Federation, has its own fleet. As we never really see any alien-style Federation ships, it's likely the Earth or human part of the Federation represents the overwhelming part of the Federation. The Vulcans are an issue, as you would expect them to be more advanced than Earth. We know that later in the series, a starship like the Enterprise is crewed exclusively by Vulcans. While unlikely, could the humans be the main builders and maintainers of the combat fleet? Christopher asks, must have taken quite a lot to build a ship like this. Kirk replies, there are only 12 like it in the fleet. Christopher states, oh, I see. Did the Navy? Kirk interrupts. We're a combined service, Captain. Our authority is the United Earth Space Probe Agency. Christopher explains, United Earth? The Enterprise received major repairs at Signet 14, which is a planet dominated by women. This is a probably not a colony planet and must have sufficient industrial, industrial and technological capacity to repair the Enterprise. Obviously, it's a Federation planet and most likely a human one at that, as only a human would program the computer in the manner that, that they did. Spock states, We put in at Sigjet 14 for a general repair and maintenance. Cygnet 14 is a planet dominated by women. They seem to feel the ship's computer lacked a personality. They gave it one, female, of course. We discover an Earth Saturn probe, which was captained by Colonel Sean Jeffrey Christopher. As it's currently 1969, and the captain may have his child by 1969 at the earliest, the mission probably occurred about 2009. This, if anything, proves the universe of Star Trek is not our universe. Another, another interesting point is by the time a manned Earth Saturn probe was launched, it would seem logical that manned missions to Mars and Jupiter would have already occurred. Bases on the Moon and Mars is equally possible. In this universe, the Earth is rapidly moving out into space, unlike the universe that we occupy here and now. Spock states, Poor choice of words on my part. I neglected in my initial run-through to correlate the possible contribution contributions by offspring, I find, after running a cross-check on that factor, that your son, Colonel Sean Jeffrey Christopher, headed, or will head, the first successful Earth Saturn probe, which is a rather significant. The most significant point in conclusion is that there is a United Earth, which runs 12 Enterprise-like capital ships under what is called United Earth Space Probe Agency. This is mentioned in Charlie X and has the abbreviations of UESPA. Originally, I suspected this was simply a precursor to Starfleet, but Starfleet is mentioned in this episode as well. What does this mean? If Starfleet is under the United Earth Space Probe Agency, then the Federation must be controlled and dominated by Earth. While this is possible for independent Earth planets, this must also apply to the Vulcans, for example. We know the Vulcans crew a ship like the Enterprise. Presumably, it's one of the 12 capital ships. The way it's looking up until now is that the Earth-Romulan War unified all the human planets in the same manner the Franco-Prussian War unified all the German states under Prussia. After the war, the Federation was formed, again, like Germany. Germany, or Deutschland, basically means land of the Deutsch, and it was a federation. If the Federation is similar to the German Federation, then we are looking at a very different view of the Federation that we may have originally had. The German Empire, which was a Federation of States, did contain non-German areas. This was mainly Polish and French, but were minor parts and an attempt to maintain their local language and custom, custom, customs was actually allowed. The initial Star Trek Universe Federation could have been the same. 
with non-humans slowly joining for economic and military benefit. If this was the case, historically, the military could very well be under the autonomy of something called the United Earth Space Probe Agency. This is fundamentally a Earth Federation. The return of the Archons is the 21st episode of the first season. It was the 22nd episode produced. The Federation sent a starship to this planet 100 years ago. It assumed that this was in 2164, which was after the Earth-Romulan War. While the episode does not specifically state the ship was an Earth ship, it's reasonable to assume that it was because it was the Federation which was tracing what happened to it. The Archons obviously landed on the planet. Incidentally, the Archons um, is the name given to the ship, and that's why they're called Archons. And they were observed, absorbed, which implies the inhabitants were human or humanoid. This is unlikely, but they may have been human enough to look the same, but not to interbreed. This means part of the population of the planet may be human. If we assume the Starship crew, half that of the Enterprise, and more of the crew were absorbed than killed, that leaves us with a population of, let's say, 108. After 100 years, this could have grown to a population of over 3,000 humans, if not much more. Sulu states, You, you did it. They knew we were Archons. These are the clothes they wear, not these. Captain's Log, Stardate 3156.2 while orbiting a planet Beta-3, trying to find some trace of the starship Archon that disappeared here a hundred years ago. Riga states, The body absorbs its enemies. It only kills when it has to. When the first Archons came, they were free, out of control, opposed the will of Landru. Many were killed, many more were absorbed. When he regains consciousness, Landru will find us through him. And if the others come... The planet where the Archon was lost is called Beta-3, in the star system C-111. This would be classed as an alien federation planet, but with a population which partially partially consisted of humans and the rest were so close as to be indistinguishable. Captain's Log, Stardate 3156.2, while orbiting a planet Beta-3, trying to find some trace of the starship Archon that disappeared here a hundred years ago, A search party consisting of two Enterprise officers was sent to the planet below. Captain's Log, Stargate 3158.7. The Enterprise is preparing to leave a Beta-3 in star system C-111. Sociologist Lindstrom is remaining behind with a party of experts who will help restore the planet's culture to a human form. The Enterprise is hit with a heat beam. From the planet, which can be negated by the shields, but the Enterprise is unable to use warp or impulse to escape. This makes no sense and obviously is a plot mechanism to keep the Enterprise there. Scott states, checking, we're going down, Captain. Unless we can get those beams off us we, so we can use our engines, we're due to hit atmosphere in less than 12 hours. It probably would have been better if the planet used a tractor beam, but anyway, that's only my opinion. Beta 3 was racked by war 6,000 years ago, and an engineer called Landru re-engineered society so it would remain static at a low technological level. Later, Landru programmed a computer as himself, and the computer continued the society. Based on the technology of the computer Landru, the technological level of this planet 6,000 years ago was as high as the Federation today. Perhaps it only lacked space travel. Riga states, there was a war, convulsions, the world was destroying itself. Landru was our leader. He saw the truth. He changed the world. He took us back to a simple time, a time of peace and tranquility. After the end of the Earth-Romulan War and the formation of the Federation, the Federation was sending exploration ships far away. A reasonable guess is the Federation doubled its size in the last hundred years and Beta-3 was still outside normal Federation space. This may make it, make it over 400 light years from Earth and possibly up to 100 light years away from the closest Federation planet. This could be why it took the Federation 100 years to go looking for the missing spacecraft, which means the Federation was sending exploration ships at least 300 light years from the Federation border 100 years ago. The planet must be in a direction where there are no Klingons or Romulans. The other interesting fact that we discover is that there was a high technological civilization on this planet 6,000 years ago when it almost collapsed to a, due to a major war. 
This would have occurred about 3764 BC, which was a long time ago. The inhabitants were, in some ways, compatible with humans. As Landru absorbed the humans, this must be a fact rather than an attempt to save money by not using makeup. Perhaps this planet did have space travel and visited Earth before 3764 BC, which may be an interesting story to tell. Could these be ancient aliens? Look, Star Trek is filled with these examples of humanoids which can interbreed all over the place. You know, another theory could be that maybe someone seeded a whole bunch of planets with human-like people. Anyway, it's something that we could possibly um, postulate in future episodes. A Taste for Armageddon is the 23rd episode of the first season. It was the 23rd episode produced. MNR7 is an alien planet, which is not part of the Federation. It has a high technological level, but possibly lacks interstellar spa space capability, although it certainly has space travel within its own system. It has had space travel capability for several hundreds of years. We later discover they must have had space travel for at least 500 years, and possibly much more, likely 700 light years ago. This means they had space travel capability about 1550 or the latest 1750. These guys have been around a long time and haven't seemed to have developed much. Captain's Log, Stargate 3192.1. The Enterprise is en route to Star Cluster, NGC 321. Objective to open diplomatic relations with the civilizations known to be there. We have sent a message to MNR7, principal planet of the Star Cluster, informing them of our friendly intentions. We are awaiting an answer. Spock states, we know very little about them. Their civilization is advanced. They've had a space flight for several centuries, but they've never ventured beyond their own solar system. When first contacted more than 50 years ago, MNR7 was at war with its nearest neighbor. The Federation sent the starship SS Valiant to MNR 50 years ago, or in 2214. We later discover it was destroyed. A gap of 50 years seems to imply MNR-7 is well beyond the borders of the Federation. Spock states, The Earth expedition, making the report, failed to return from its mission. The USS Valiant, listed as missing in space. The Enterprise represents the United Federation of Planets, which is the first time this term is used. While the Federation has been used before, this is the full name. No mention of a United Earth Space Probe Agency, although... That is the name of the combined services rather than the political entity. Kirk states, I am Captain James T. Kirk of the Starship Enterprise representing the United Federation of Planets. The third planet in this system is also inhabited. It was colonised by MNR-7, became independent and has engaged in war with MNR-7 for 500 years. For Vendikar to be a threat, its colonization must have become 100 to 200 years prior to this day. Anar states, the third planet in our system, called Vendikar, originally settled by our people and now a ruthless enemy, highly advanced technologically, we have been at war for 500 years. Later, Anand pleads, don't you understand, Captain? We have done away with all that. Now you are threatening to bring it down on us again. Are those 500 people of yours more important than the hundreds of millions of innocent people on MNR and Vendikar? What kind of monster are you? We discover the Vulcans have some telepathic capacity over distance. We know that Spock can mind meld when he touches someone, but this is the first time he does it where he's not touching. Spock states, Limited telepathic abilities are inherent in Vulcans, Captain. It may work, it may not. The MNR-7 military used disruptors, which is the same as the Gorn. Security states, the Federation prisoners have attacked their guards and escaped. They are armed. Disintegration station number 12, destroyed. Councilman, apparently, by disruptor fire. The Enterprise is called a Star Cruiser. This could be uh, the name given to capital ships, but it could be a specific term only the local civilization uses. Anand, all security personnel, Federation prisoners have escaped. They are to be found. They are armed. If they resist, do what is necessary. Planetary disruptor banks, calculate orbit of star cruiser now circling. Stand by to fire. Full power. We discover in this episode that if the screens, or perhaps shields, are active, phasers cannot be fired, but photon torpedoes can. I assume they can be fired away from the ship to its rear and then can turn around and hit their targets. 
Scott Scotty states, we can't fire full phases with our screens up, and we can't lower our screens with their disruptors on us. Of course, I could have I could treat them to a few a dozen photon torpedoes. For a second time, we learn the Federation has penal colonies, which can be used for military staff disobeying orders. Fox, your refusal to comply with my orders has endangered the entire success of this mission. I can have you sent to a penal colony for this. The Enterprise has the capability of destroying a civilization on an entire planet. Kirk states, All that it means is that I won't be around for the destruction. You've heard me give a general order 24. That means in two hours the Enterprise will destroy MNR7. Scott replies, All cities and installation on MNR7 have been located, identified and fed into our fire control system in one hour and 45 minutes. The Enterprise heads off to another planet. In this case, Argona too. It's unlikely to be a new target of exploration and is probably a Federation planet. It's probably not a colony, mining, research or farming planet. It's most likely a human inhabited Federation planet. It could be an alien inhabited Federation planet as well. Kirk, lay in a course for Argona 2. Navigator, Mr. Scott. We discover another alien civilization which has had space travel for 500 to 700 years and yet they did not expand beyond their system. This is in stark contrast with the humans, who commonly sent exploration ships 400 light-years away from their closest friendly planet. This occurred even before war was developed and continued under the Federation to this day, according to the episode, anyway. The SS Valiant was destroyed trying to establish relations with MNR-7 50 years previously. As it took the Federation 50 years to find out what happened, this planet must be a reasonable distance away. 50 years ago, it may have been 1 to 200 light years away. Yet the Federation wants to establish a diplomatic relations with a planet that far away. Another example of its aggressive, ag aggressive expansionary drive. You could blame the Earth-Romulan War on this, but the humans were just as expansionary before the war, which may have been the reason why they had a war with the Romulans. I would expect both planets eventually join the Federation, but I suspect this will not be very soon or in the near to distant future. This ends this video. The episode scripts can be found on the URL shown or in the notes. It becomes obvious that many of the later Star Trek movies and shows do not align with the original vision of the series. This is common in real history as later historians attempt to change the past in order to justify their beliefs in the present. Live long and prosper, Star Trek fans.